is God's word. See, it's the Holy Scripture. You believe that Jesus died for your sins, that he was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven and is coming back again one day? If you believe that, would you please stand?
Ten cities, very good. Okay, so Sea of Galilee, the area of Galilee, area of the Gerasenes, and then broader, uh, the area of the Decapolis. And then right down the center aisle is the Jordan River. So coming out of the Sea of Galilee, going downstream toward the south is the Jordan River. And so you are on either side of the Jordan River. Most of it is wilderness with little towns every once in a while, right? Uh, and then you're also going to have, you guys are going to be Samaria over here. And then out there in the lobby, uh, this, this Jordan River dumps into the what? One of the lowest places on earth, the Dead Sea. The reason it's dead is because it doesn't flow out anywhere, and so the salt um, builds up there because it doesn't have anywhere to go, and the water flowing through it, just into it, okay? So, if I gave you a piece of paper and asked you to draw that, you could do really well, couldn't you? Pretty simple. Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. You start there. Okay, kind of Samaria over this side, wilderness over this side. The area of Galilee, the area of the Gerasenes, and the Decapolis. Now, there's more than just that, but uh, for us today, uh, that's all you really need to know for our stories that I want to share with you. The title of today's message is Possessed, Sick, and Dead. Doesn't that grab you? <laughs> you just want to go home and share that with people? So you ought to come to my church. Pastor was talking about people being possessed, sick, and dead. It was, it was exciting. It was very uplifting. And I hope it will be, actually. And so, the book of Mark, written by Mark, okay, uh, not a direct disciple of Jesus, but uh, kind of a young lad, and saw the things that were going on, uh, really kind of believed that maybe Peter has great influence uh, in Mark's writing. Um, but he was eyewitness to a number of things. And so... This is Mark's story. Uh, Mark 5, he tells three stories within that chapter. So I want to share those stories with you today. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Okay, who is they? They are the disciples and part of the crowd. Jesus is over in this area of the Galilee. He's teaching. He's doing miracles, feeding 5,000, doing all those kinds of great things over here. And he says, let's go to the other side of the lake. And he gets in a boat, and it says there are other boats with them. Uh, and they go across the lake, and we'll look more at the details of this story about their trip across the lake at the end. But let's go ahead and get over to the other side of the lake. Jesus gets out of the boat, and uh, the Gerasenes' Teddy comes to greet him. <laughs> right? The, the greeting committee of one, uh, except that's where the similarities stop, because uh, this greeting committee is possessed by many demons. <laughs> Teddy's not in here today. Oh, she has talked about it. I've heard it. <laughs> yes, I've heard it. <laughs> um, so, but can you picture, here is this person who's full of demons and is the one who comes to greet Jesus. Hi, Jesus, I'm evil spirit. You're good spirit. I can tell that just by the way you smile. Okay? Well, maybe that's not the whole picture, except it is true. That's the one who came and greeted Jesus. This man lived in tombs, and he came to meet Jesus. He was a person who could not be bound by anybody. The townspeople had chained his wrist and his ankles over and over again, and he broke the chains. Now, if you look around the room, I want you to see who in here you think that if they were shackled and chained, could break those chains and shackles. Y'all looking at Nate Kennedy, right? <laughs> Thinking maybe Nate could do that. Nate stand up. Just, could Nate stand up? Doesn't he look strong enough that he could do that? <laughs> let's try. Let's try. <laughs> let's, let's, let's just see. <laughs> of course he couldn't. Ain't strong. Ain't not that strong, right? Um, so this is one big guy that you don't want to mess with. He had often been chained hand and foot, broke the chains apart. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Uh, night and day among the tombs, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now, why would anybody do this? He'd go, ah! And be cutting himself. Well, he'd probably be screaming because he's cutting himself. That makes sense. Pretty frightening if you lived around there. Pretty scary. If you had children, you'd be worried every night that they would just be trying to go to sleep in fear if you were anywhere near this guy. But why would somebody do that to themselves? I want to give you just a, a, a little observation. That typically when someone hurts themselves really bad, it's because they don't like something about themselves. 
because they have a, a hatred within them, and they're, they're going to typically respond one of two ways. They're either going to hurt themselves, or they're going to turn it outward, and they're going to hurt someone else. Now, if you have that hurt that you just want to escape from, and you go to either extreme, uh, and these aren't the only reason these two things happen, but many times it's suicide and murder, right? That, I mean, that's the ultimate hurting yourself or ultimate hurting somebody else. Again, those things do happen for other reasons sometimes, but a number of times that, that is that hate, hatred toward yourself. You just, you've got to get it out somehow. You can't bear to live with it at some point. And, and so this guy's possessed by all these demons and, and he's got to get it out. And, and it looks like really instead of hurting others, because it doesn't say he's doing that, he might be scaring them, but he's hurting himself. And he sees Jesus from a distance. And do you remember what happened when the prodigal son came? God, the father in the story, saw him from a distance and came running to meet the son. In this case, this person, this demon-possessed man, sees Jesus from a distance, comes running to greet him, and falls at his feet. Falls right at the feet of Jesus. And he says, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you will not torture me. He immediately recognizes who Jesus is. Isn't it funny how sane people often don't recognize who Jesus is, but this mentally disturbed person, this demon-possessed person, the demons actually recognized who Jesus was. And when Jesus hears that and sees that, sees him down his feet, he says, come out of him, you evil spirit. Now, if Jesus says, come out of him, you evil spirit, what does the evil spirit normally do? Yeah. Right on. Listens, right? Comes out. This is a strong evil spirit. And a smart evil spirit. It does not come out of him right away. And Jesus thinking, well, all right, I'll play your game. Tell me your name. Maybe that's it. Maybe we didn't get properly introduced. Tell me your name. And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. A legion uh, in Rome was 6,000 men and 120 horses. Now, that's not saying that there were exactly 6,120 demons in him. What he's saying is there's a lot of us up to that man. Right? In fact, I would say by record, this would be the greatest demon possession in all of human history, the strongest demon possession that there ever has been. And Jesus is standing there and tells him, come out. He doesn't come out. He says, what's your name? My name is Legion, for we are many. And then something really unique happens. The, uh, the demons beg Jesus not to send them away. What does that mean? To send them in just to the nether world. You see, they have a, a need to possess something, which is usually a human being. But if not, at least maybe that herd of pigs over there, 2,000 pigs over there, Jesus, we'll go three together in each pig. Just send us over there. Send us into something so we can possess something. Don't just send us away. Jesus agrees. He allows them to do that. He sends the demons out of the man into the pigs. And the scripture says the pigs rush down the hill into the water and they drown. Now what happens after that? Well, the unclean man is now clean. He is no longer possessed by demons. Can you imagine after all that time of hating himself so much, not being able to get away from this possession, not maybe praying and, and even trying to get rid of it, and nothing happens, and living with it, and, and just wishing he would die, now that's gone. He's completely 100% healed, sane, never going to hurt himself again. And he's right there before Jesus. But now the pigs have gone off. And so now for this Jewish rabbi person, he's just done two things for the Jews. One is he's gotten rid of these demons, but he's also gotten rid of 2,000 pigs. It wasn't just about eating pork. There are other things in the Old Testament where pigs and Jews just don't go together. And, and so it was no loss for the disciples and those who witnessed this to see 2,000 pigs go, and a great joy to see this man healed. I mean, which is the lesson, right? Well, to those townspeople, 
That was their livelihood. In fact, those who owned the pigs ran into town and they told everybody about it, what Jesus had done. They said, look, your guys' livelihood is in danger too because who knows what else this guy's going to do. We better go do something about this right now. So the entire town comes out and they go to Jesus. And here's this man who's been screaming and cutting himself and breaking chains and they can't subdue him. Healed. Never mind about him. Jesus, go away from us. We don't want your kind here because you're hurting our lives. We'd rather have this, the demoniac, the one possessed by demons, and still have our pigs that have you here. And Jesus gets into the boat, goes back over to the area of Galilee. And that's where our next two stories take place. So now we're, we're over there. The, dem oh, the demoniac is healed, and, and he wants to go with Jesus. I'm with you. When you say, hey, can I go along with you? Jesus says, no, go home to your family. Tell them what I've done and why I've done it. What I've done is I've healed you. Why I've done it is because I'm full of mercy. And I show mercy upon you. Go tell your family that. And, and be restored to them. Who he hasn't been around for a long time. And he not only does that, but it says he goes to the Decapolis. Around the ten cities. To witness and tell people what Jesus had done and why he had done it. Over on the other side. A uh, great crowd is, is around Jesus. And you can picture this, can't you? Um, I don't know what big superstar there was in your day. I'm looking at some of you and it was Clark Gable. I'm looking at some of you, and it was Elvis Presley or the Beatles. Um, I'm, well, the youth went out, so I don't have to go there. Um, I, I know I wouldn't know where to go. Um, uh, for some, it might be Michael Jordan or a Tiger Woods or whatever. That person that, um, wherever they are, there's a crowd around them if they're out in public. And people want to do what? They want to get a selfie. They want to get an autograph. Just even want to touch the person. I know that on a, a lot of these um, uh, singing competition shows, when the singer who's becoming famous now by being on the show will come out and he'll put his hands down by the stage and people just want to reach up and touch that person. And, and so that's how it would have been with Jesus. They had heard about this new miracle now. And so people are gathered around him, dozens, maybe hundreds, pushing in close, trying to get close to him and just touch him. And they're walking along. And as they're walking along, there's a ruler of the synagogue, uh, basically kind of the one who organized everything and made everything happen in the synagogue the way it's supposed to, uh, somehow gets through the crowd and gets to Jesus and says to Jesus, and remember, the religious leaders are the ones that always seem to have the problems with Jesus. So this had to be a struggle for this guy because he didn't believe things the way that Jesus believed them. But came and said to Jesus, my daughter, my 12-year-old daughter, is very sick. In fact, Jesus, she's dying, and I'm desperate. And I don't know if women can really understand this. Maybe you can. There's always talk about that nurturing thing that women have for their children and all that. But I can tell you from personal experience, the protection mode that kicks in when you're a father with a daughter is amazingly strong that you would do anything to protect your daughter. And for him, he would even go kind of against other people. That, you know, stay away from Jesus. He's a radical. We don't believe what he believes. He's stirring things up. He came right to Jesus because that's his last hope. His daughter's dying. Please come and heal her. And Jesus says, let's go. And they start going. And as they're going, Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples get to play the straight man right now. They say, what do you mean, who touched you? There's dozens of people around you touching you, but lots of people have touched you today, Jesus. He goes, no, 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 no. You understand, I felt the power go out of me. Well, what had happened was there was a woman standing way back behind the crowd because she's really needs to, almost like a leper to stay out of the community. Because she's been bleeding for 12 years. She's gone to every doctor she can go to, and none of them have helped. There's been no test that's been run that could tell her what's wrong with her. There's been no medicine administered that could help her. She's paid out, paid, paid out every penny that she's had. She has nothing less. She's desperate. She's heard about Jesus. So this is an unclean Jewish woman. And she's not supposed to be touching anybody. But in her mind, she thinks if, if this Jesus has that power that people are saying that he has to heal people, I don't need to get close to him. All I need to do is touch his garment. In fact, Barely his garment, just the lowest, smallest part, the hem of his garment. If I just could touch that, 
Nobody will notice, nobody will see me, and I'll get away. And maybe I'll find healing. And so she goes and she speaks through the crowd. She touches the hem of his garment and starts going away. But can you imagine? Some of you have had chronic illnesses, haven't you? Some of you have been healed of those chronic illnesses, of cancer. Some of you have, um, are living with a chronic illness. But for those of you who have been through it or have been sick for a long time and then made well, that feeling is amazing and almost too like, is this real? I, I, I didn't remember or ever think I could feel this well again. And so she probably stopped in her tracks just being amazed at this. And Jesus is back over here and he's having this discussion with the disciples about um, who touched me. And he turns, and as he turns, we can picture the crowd parting, and the woman comes out of embarrassment and falls at Jesus' feet, knowing that she should not have done that. And he tells her that it's her faith, her, her amazing faith, to, for her just to think to touch his garment would make her well, has healed her. Now imagine you're J Jairus, standing over here, kind of anxious. Your daughter's dying. And while this scene's taking place and finishing up over here, and Jesus is concluding with her, somebody comes from your house and tells you, don't bother Jesus anymore. Your daughter's died. It's too late. How does Jairus feel about this healing over here? <clears throat> she was sick for 12 years. She could have been sick for 12 more hours. She could have waited, but my daughter couldn't have waited. She was dying, and now she's dead. And now there's nothing, absolutely nothing I can do. Jesus, aware of what's going on, comes over, grabs Jairus by the arm, says, crowd, sorry, but it's over for today. Peter, James, and John, you come with me. And he and the four of them go off to Jairus' house, and they come into the house. Jairus' wife is there. The daughter is lying in the bedroom, dead. And there are wailers and mourners there. Now, we're not certain about this for these, but often as part of a kind of ceremony, it would pay people like professional moaners and wailers. And so let's see how well you would do. So let's, let's say somebody's just died, and we're paying you to moan and wail. You ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> I'm taking my money somewhere else. <laughs> I'm a weak wailer. Um, but anyway, Jesus comes to his house, and they're wailing and moaning and doing what they're supposed to do. And, and Jesus looks at them and says, shut up. She's not dead. She's just asleep. And they laugh at him and he tells them to get out. He takes the mom and the dad, Jairus, and Peter, James, John. He goes into her room. He bends down. He takes her by the hand and says, Talafakum, little girl, get up. And immediately the scripture says she stands up. Parents overwhelmed with joy. And Jesus basically says, now just get back to life, okay? Go cook her some dinner. Sit down at the table together and be family. Your daughter is alive. And I give her back. Three great stories, all in one chapter of the Bible. I believe every one of them connected. So this is where that table is if you're on the U version. If you're not, that's okay. Uh, because I'm going to speak it to you and, and share it with you. I just looked at all three of these stories and I put them side by side to see what kind of things they have in common, what kind of things they have different. So it's kind of just like summarizing the three stories. And so over here we have Legion. That's what we'll call it, right? Because he said my name is Legion. That's really the demons. Uh, here, and that's, and that's mental illness. Here we have Termi. Uh, she doesn't have a name. Most people like this in the Bible don't get names. Uh, it's interesting that Jairus that his name is given, because normally it would just be a ruler of the synagogue. But Termi, for terminally ill, the, the woman. Uh, and then we have Jairus, or, and also J.D., Jairus' daughter, uh, over here, okay? So, Legion is possessed, mental illness. It's also physical and spiritual, obviously. Termi is sick, and she is an unclean Jew. Legion was a Gentile. And Jairus is a righteous Jew, right? Ruler of the synagogue. Legion lived in the tombs. Termi more than likely lived alone because of her condition. Jairus' daughter lived with her parents, probably in a fairly decent home for the position 
that he had. Legion could not be bound even with chains. Turvey suffered a great deal for 12 years. Jairus' daughter was very, very, very sick until she died. Legion cried out and cut himself. Turvey spent every penny she had, went to all the doctors and couldn't find help anywhere. Jairus pleaded with Jesus to come and heal his daughter. Legion ran and fell at Jesus' feet. Turvey came in quiet humiliation and fell at Jesus' feet. Jairus came on the behalf of another and fell at Jesus' feet. Legion, a legion of 6,000 demons, Termi, unclean and alone, Jairus, a synagogue ruler. Jesus spoke a word to Legion. Termi touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Jesus took the hand of a girl who was dead and raised her to life. Interesting, isn't it, that all three people kind of lived in very different situations, different ages, different places of life, different kinds of illnesses. And, and I say that this one over here was really a spiritual illness. So obviously, it had physical as well. But because of J. Iris' physical struggle to get past what he believed to come to Jesus, they had all these different things. And they were even healed in different ways. But Jesus is at the center of every single one of them. The people told Jesus to go away. They'd rather have the demoniac than the one who could heal him. The disciples said, how can you say who touched you? They're still bewildered and don't quite get who Jesus is. And the mourners laughed. At Jesus. They think Jesus can't tell the difference between death and sleep. And finally, Jesus says, go tell. Go tell your family. Go home to your family. Tell them how much the Lord's done for you and how he's had mercy on you. Termi may tell. He doesn't say go tell or don't go tell. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. And over here, don't tell. Jesus gave the parents strict orders not to tell anyone about this. Why would that be? Well, first of all, they've been through enough. Right? Secondly, a lot of people wouldn't believe the story. But in each and every case, don't you think they all told? Whether they were told to or told not to, of course they would have. Over here, the demons are departed, disease is destroyed, and death is defeated. Let's bring this all together by going back to the other side, okay? In fact, let's go back in time a little bit more. Let's go back to just before those three stories took place. Jesus is over here. He's teaching in the area of Galilee, He's healing, feeding people, uh, doing all those things, and he says, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And he gets in the boat. There's some other boats with them, accompanying them, and this big squall comes up. Have you ever been caught in a bad storm on a lake? In a boat. Yeah. I mean, I've been there and done that numerous times. Uh, and every time I do that and my wife's in the boat, I have to buy a bigger boat. Uh, because I have. I mean, we've nearly been swamped and killed on a couple of different occasions. I know that always encourages people to go on a boat, by the way. And in fact, one of them was American Falls. It got vicious one day. And, Literally, it almost took us out. So, so I, I get that. And I can't imagine when it's that bad, somebody's sleeping in the boat. The scripture says that as this was taking place and the winds and the waves grew and things got bigger and worse, and the Sea of Galilee is fairly big. If you're out in the middle and you go over, you're done. That's it. You're not swimming to shore. Uh, so they're frightened. And they come to Jesus because he's asleep in the back of the boat on a cushion. And they wake up and say, Master, Master. Wake up, don't you care that we're drowning? And Jesus stands up and he says, peace, be still. And the winds subside and the waves calm down. And the disciples look at each other right in front of Jesus as if he can't hear them. They say, who is this? You know, they've been with him, they've seen his miracles, but now, he said, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. I mean, we kind of get maybe demon possession. We, we get a little bit maybe the healing of a lame man. 
But this is inanimate creation. The winds and the waves even obey him. And that is exactly what took place <coughs> just after the storm, three other storms were brewing. Just like those storms, Jesus was right at the center of them. And nobody really had reason to be afraid, but in every one of those situations, people had great fear. The storm was raging for Legion, for the woman bleeding, for Jairus and his daughter and her mother. Jesus shows up and calms each one of these three unique storms. And I ask, what storm are you facing? What storm is there in your life right now? And it may be tumultuous, or it may be just a little storm, a little bit of bad weather that you want to get out of. Well, listen to what Jesus said to the disciples in the midst of their fear, right after he calmed the storm. Verse 40. What are you so afraid of? Do you still have no faith? We, like they, and people in each of these three stories should be struck with awe and have a holy fear and say what the disciples said in verse 41. Who is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. What is my storm in the presence of Jesus that can't be healed and calmed and made well? What is my storm that I've tried everything else of my own power to fix and now it's just time to come to Jesus and wake him up? Say, Jesus, I'm in the midst of the storm. And I need you to speak a word. I need to touch the hem of your garment. I need you to take my hand. You know, I wish there were a song. I wish there were a song that would talk to my mental challenges. Believe me, I have lots of mental challenges. A song that would say something like, There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say, it is well. Now, I wish there were a song that would address my physical needs, that when I'm struggling physically, to, a song that would speak words that would encourage me and strengthen me. Words that would say, there's a day that's drawing near, when this darkness, imagine her being healed after 12 years, when this darkness breaks to light, and the shadows disappear, and my faith shall be my eyes. Would speak to my spiritual storm and say, Jesus has overcome, and the grave, she was dead, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead. I hear the voice of many angels saying, Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the cry of every longing heart say, Worthy is the Lamb. That whatever our storm is, I wish there was a song that would say, and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before my God and fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. I wish there was a song that would capture all of that. Whether our storm is mental, physical, spiritual, or a combination of all three. Well, there is, and we're about to sing it. I want to invite you, uh, as we sing this closing song, the prayer room is open if you'd like to pray with a prayer team member. But also the altar is here. It's a great space to come and kneel. And just on your own, pray. Just to bring your sin, if that's what your storm is, to the cross. To bring the mental struggles that you're having, or the physical or the spiritual storm that you're in the midst of, to bring it to the foot of Jesus. Or maybe there's somebody else. Maybe you have a 12-year-old daughter or a mother or somebody who just needs your prayer right now and you would fall on your knees and pray to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. I invite you to come. There's a peace I've come to know Though my
his mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we'd ever dare to ask or even dream of infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. Now, glory be to God through the church and through Jesus Christ throughout all generations, both now and forever. And all those who know the healing, life-giving power of Jesus say, Amen. Amen.